giving me a second to get set up here. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today to discuss different ways that we can accompany unaccompanied immigrant children throughout their immigration journey. We initially brought this panel together because we noticed that this immigration system seems to be getting more and more delayed. And as children continue to struggle to obtain immigration relief, um, they become subject to exploitation. Um, they encounter new complications, uh, some which directly affect their immigration relief. And so our hope is that by joining us today, you can find different avenues or junctures in which you can rescreen your clients to better incorporate the principles of universal representation. Um, and by doing so, keeping that access, that door to the immigration system open um, to our clients. As uh, Victoria said, unfortunately, Maida cannot join us today. So we're gonna do our very best to try and incorporate all the wonderful information she shared with us in preparation for today's panel um, into our answers. So with that, I did want to open the panel by asking Alyssa and Hannah, if you could give us a little background on what exactly is going on right now in the immigration landscape and help us understand what's causing these long delays in the immigration system. Thank you, Deanna. Um, well, one of the things that within our children's program work that we have seen here in Raices, um, the most commonly identified relief that we have seen um, is either special immigrant juvenile status or asylum. And while these forms of relief have their own benefits, um, there are considerations and limitations for both. So I want to focus first on SIJS. Um, the biggest challenge that we're seeing at this point um, with SIJS are these long wait times. Um, and there's long wait times for our clients at several stages of the SIJS application process. First, at the predicate order stage, when you're getting that first state court order um, for the child. Second, adjudications on the I-360 for SIJS are taking on average about nine months um, to get that approval by USCIS. Despite the fact that there is a congressional mandate that adjudication should be no more than 180 days, these long wait periods at these first two stages um, expose children to a variety of harms, uh, like, for example, the inability to work lawfully, which then leads to the potential of exploitative employers, um, and also the inability to access a driver's license in many states. Um, especially uh, in states with strict enforcement heavy laws, this can expose children then also to the risk of having more frequent contact with law enforcement, um, the risk of being criminally prosecuted, and also even um, the prioritiz prioritization for deportation. Once clients are approved, they then join the long, excruciatingly long um, SIJS backlog of cases while they wait for their priority date to become available um, to adjust status to legal permit residency. Last year in the spring, there were more than 100,000 youth in that backlog. So we're, I'm sure we're seeing a much ex more exponential number at this point. It takes about an average of five years to adjust status to legal permit residency. So during this wait, it's important to remember that SIJS clients don't really have a firm legal status. So the clients in that backlog are trapped in a legal limbo, which is that they're vulnerable to shifting policies and a variety of harms at that point. <clears throat> First of all, the inability to access benefits that would help them to address hunger, homelessness, medical care, and in some states, even um, difficulty accessing higher education. Further, clients in the backlog face the shifting policies and changes and regulations that we see upended during different presidential administrations. Uh, under Trump, for example, approval ratings for SIJS went down significantly as NOIDs rose to 16% uh, during a period, that period of time, 
and RFEs also rose to a period of 35%. So that is, a, you know, that was a major issue that we were having. Also during that, that administration, SIJS clients were in, that were in the backlog were being removed and deported while waiting for their priority date to become current. I think another challenge we saw with the vulnerability of the immigration system, how it constantly changes from administration to administration is, at RAISIS, we were seeing at the adjustment stage, revocation of the approved SIJS. So it just goes to show even with an approval, if the system is being volatile, um, that can be an application or an access that can later be revoked or removed as a potential opportunity. Um, Hannah, can you walk us through the asylum backlog, explaining a little bit what this backlog is um, and how it affects our cases? Yeah, thanks, Sienna. So both USCIS and EOIR have record, record numbers of pending asylum claims. You can see in the chart here, it's uh, as of November 30th, 2022, and EOIR has continue to break records with the number of claims that have been filed. So between those two agencies, there are literally millions of pending asylum claims. You know, with unaccompanied kids cases, we're filing affirmatively with USCIS, which gives interviews on sort of a last filed first interviewed system. So if your application that you file isn't interviewed relatively quickly, you're looking at potentially up to a 30 year backlog considering the number of cases that are filed, which is quite a long time for a case to be pending. So a lot of things um, can, can change, can go wrong during that time. Um, and during that time, the kid doesn't have access to resources that can form the, the foundation for self-reliance. Um, you know, those of you who work on asylum cases probably know that there's about a six month waiting period after you file a claim where most of the time you can file for a work permit or an EAD at that point. Um, but EADs are only, were only valid for five years. And so if a case is pending for up to 30 years, that's several renewals that that child will have to have to do. And renewals um, are significantly delayed. So oftentimes we're seeing a gap in um, in validity for those EADs, which can cause problems for a person, not just with their employer, but also uh, with getting an ID, getting access to a driver's license in states that um, that link those two, you know, having a, a valid work authorization card um, and, you know, all, uh, a cascade sort of, of, of issues that um, come from not having that document, um, a valid work document. There's also, as Alyssa mentioned with in SIJS cases, there's also uh, a lack of access to benefits that kids might be eligible for should that asylum case eventually be approved. Um, and this is also probably somewhat state specific or even locale specific within states. But um, here in Texas, with few exceptions, kids don't have access to um, health insurance if they don't have a stable legal status. So for example, I have a young client who's a teenager. She has um, a, a cyst growing in her neck. She's gone to the ER several times and has been told, come back when you either are having trouble breathing or having trouble swallowing. Whereas if she has um, had access to health insurance, she may be able to get a better quality or more consistent care for that issue or other issues that she may be having. During this long wait time, Laws can also change, both due to cases and moving in the federal court system, and also we've seen changes in administration mean that uh, attorneys general can certify cases to themselves to pretty quickly shape the law. And because EOIR and USCIS are administrative bodies under the executive branch, they can change policy or reinterpret policy pretty quickly to change what agent what agents can do and how those agents are evaluating cases. And lastly, um, during that long period of time, evidence can grow stale. It can be um, impossible to get evidence that maybe existed at one point in time. Uh, memories change, whether due to um, trauma or due to therapy or due to just 
a long uh, passage of time. And even circumstances in, in their home countries can change. And so, um, you know, during these cases that are pending for years or even decades um, can be pretty problematic. Um, I completely hear uh, the concerns and, and we even saw right under the Trump administration changes in law with matter AB and then in the Fifth Circuit with HACO that can drastically affect eligibility. And now our kids, right, they can potentially age out of child-based social groups, which is a big risk. Um, Alyssa, I want to touch back on something that you mentioned. You were talking about um, the anti-immigrant political landscape. Can you share some examples with us? Yes, sure. We, we practice here, here at Raiz, as most of us are practicing here in Texas, and we've seen a wave of anti-immigrant legislation. Not um, We're talking at the state level um, here, starting with Operation Lone Star, uh, which was initiated in March of 2021. Oper Operation Lone Star is a state-led immigration enforcement program that's been wreaking havoc here in our state. This past year, we also saw the passage of SB4, which criminalizes immigrants who have entered the state of Texas without proper do documentation. So this bill has both misdemeanor charges for illegal entry and felony charges for illegal re-entry into the state. Um, there's also provisions in another bill that increase penalties for smuggling. And we've seen clients come through that have been um, prosecuted under these laws and these enforcement policies, which then of course makes it difficult um, and makes complications later in their immigration cases. But this issue, many people think maybe this is limited to Texas, but no, this is not limited to Texas. Nationwide, we are seeing other states follow in Texas's lead um, and they're passing similar types of legislation that criminalize immigrants. Um, laws that mandate some type of law enforcement, um, cooperation with ICE, anti-sanctuary laws, or laws that are similar in scope to Texas and even the laws that we see have been passed in Florida. Um, thank you for sharing that, Alyssa. In, in preparing for the panel, um, Maida wanted us to kind of incorporate how these anti-immigration political movements and, and these delays are affecting the kids from a social perspective. Um, she had shared with us that she had seen an increase in the fear among children and families, um, that there's a higher need for mental and health wellness. Uh, the delays in the EAD, um, even though you get that automatic extension if you apply before the expiration, doesn't really mean that civil society will respect those extensions. So she's had several clients run issues with licensing, identification, which then affects access to mental health, um, work, sustainability, self-sufficiency. Um, so she she really wanted to outline how these delays affect the clients on the day-to-day, -day, even just getting a job, access to food, and access to health. Um, we had initially wanted to expand on that with Maida on how she thought that incorporating rescreening can really help um, preserve the best interest of these children um, and further incorporate the principles of the universal representation model. But I'm gonna I'm gonna shift that to Alyssa if you don't mind helping us out and and kind of voicing um, Maida's concerns and experiences. Yes, might might have mentioned that um, <clears throat> in kind. They um, are, they really focus on maintaining constant communication with a client. Uh, to let them know that they are always keeping their best interests in mind. Um, so they they have periodic ch check-ins and things that they do with the client. And as they educate the clients on new av avenues of relief and the benefits that they can receive under those avenues of relief, um, they are really empowering the client to make choices in the legal process. And she did mention that there are different, of course, Federal, federal or state benefits that are afforded to different types of relief. So it's really an education process for those clients. Yeah, throughout the life of the case, because we're seeing cases uh, take so long and be there's such a high backlog, um, the client's life will take different turns through those years. 
Um, and there's new information that could come up. And that could be because something new has happened or it could be because they're more comfortable in their surroundings or they've got better rapport with their legal team or their case managers. And so that new information that comes out as we develop relationships with, with our clients should inform what relief we per pursue for that child, whether or not um, that was a case that was um, initially identified in the beginning stages of that, that relationship with them. Um, you know, there might be a stronger case that emerges later um, than the case that was initially identified. For example, um, I'm, uh, I was transferred a case uh, of a, a client who had been working with races for a number of years and had, um, had initially been identified as SIJS eligible and that didn't, didn't quite uh, pan out and then was transferred to me soon after there was a U visa certification filed in her case. And so we had a little bit under six months to try and file her U visa before that signature expired on the certification. And, um, you know, working on her declaration for that U visa case, some new information came out um, about some facts that led us to believe she had been labor trafficked. And not, not recently, but years before, when she had already been working with um, some, uh, an attorney outside of races and then inside of races, but she hadn't disclosed those facts before. And you know, that could be because of the trauma. It could be because she didn't realize that that would have, was important information that we might want to know. But, you know, this came out while we were working with, with uh, her on the U visa declaration. And so we kept, you know, that, that information in there um, because it was relevant to her U visa as well. We kept working on the U visa and we filed it, but then we also worked up the T visa and filed that as well. Both of those cases are currently pending, but I think the T visa um, will give her, uh, hopefully, it, you know, assuming that it's that it's approved, it will result in her gaining a more stable legal status much more quickly than the U visa. And that's something that emerged, again, years after we had had a relationship with this child as an organization. Yes, I also have noticed in my practice, um, when I use rescreening, and searching for alternate forms of relief, I'm allowing myself to to really meet the needs of that the, of the child uh, more more fully, um, really empowering them to be part of the process. Um, many of the kids that I work with express disappointment and worry when we discuss the limitations on SIJS relief of being able to eventually petition for their supportive parent. Um, that might that's the parent that is supporting them through the the state court process that they're living with. Um, and when they find out that even down the line that they can, you know, when they become a, a citizen, that they cannot ever petition for that parent, it's very distressing. Uh, and many clients are devastated by that. Um, they they really want to maintain the unity with their family, you know, and 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 be able to build a future here with their family members. So um, when we rescreen, um, sometimes there are other types of eligibilities that pop up that do allow them um, to be able to eventually petition for their supportive parents, like for, for, for example, through asylum or even through eligibility for U or T status as derivatives. So that's really important. Um, we're often working within a system that has been designed to keep children apart from their supportive parents or their supportive family members. Um, and I believe rescreening is an opportunity to promote family unity and reunification within our work. Um, for example, I had a client we were working up as an asylum case, and uh, we even went to the uh, asylum interview with the, with the officer but while preparing for that interview, we discovered that the client was not attending school. She was had a lot of problems with truancy and, and had even become homeless. Uh, as we, deci we decided that we really needed to rescreen her and decide, try and understand what her needs were and what was going on. And we found out that her father had been traffic trafficking her, um, labor trafficking her here in the United States. 
So we proceeded to um, apply for a T visa. And because she was a minor, she was able to petition for her mother and her four siblings who still resided in Honduras at that time as derivatives on her T. Her client attended the, my client attended the asylum interview and the T was filed shortly thereafter. Um, after only 18 months, she was approved for the T and, and so was her derivatives. But a few weeks before her T approval came in, we had received word that her asylum claim had been denied. So not only had we found a stronger relief for her, but we were able to really help her to um, reunify with her family members. Um, she was able, she was recently reunif reunified with her five family members from Honduras after they finished consular processing. So it was a really powerful and emotional family reunification moment. That, that sounds like an emotional roller coaster and an illegal one too, getting whiplash, right? You're finding the better relief while you still have to prep up the asylum, and then you finish the trafficking when you get the denial for the asylum. Um, but what a turn of events, basically having her father, her caretaker, exploit her to then finally getting sustainability, family unity, community, and support. Um, that's definitely an incredibly successful story. Thank you for sharing, Alyssa. Um, Cecily, I want to pull you in a little bit here because as a legal assistant, you're usually the one more on the front lines than us, the attorneys. You have more consistent, regular com communications with the clients. They're usually calling you more often, checking in with you and you with them. How have you seen the rescreening process affect the clients? Thank you, Deanna. And yes, I think you make a great point. Um, you know, for thing, I think that the legal assistant is often the person the client will reach out to first, um, especially if there's some sort of crisis situation, because we're often the one who makes contact with them to schedule them appointments in the office to, you know, let them know, for example, that their EAD has arrived at the office and, you know, that bills rapport. And then on top of that, you know, when cases require declarations, it's really most of the time the legal assistant who sits down with them and works up those declarations. So a lot of a lot of trust and rapport is built through that. Um, and I think y'all have made wonderful examples um, about the importance of legal of rescreening on the legal end of things. Um, but in my experience, I've also noticed that this type of rescreening um, can also have a lot of benefits for the mental health of our clients. Um, I think sometimes that we, op we operate under the assumption that working up a declaration will be a very traumatic experience for the client. It might re-traumatize them to have to think about everything they've gone through. And that's definitely, that definitely can be true. Um, but one thing I've also seen is that working up a declaration for many clients, it's, a, it's an opportunity to help give them agency. It's an opportunity for them to tell their story, which um, can be very cathartic for, for many of them, especially for clients who are parents or caregivers and often feel like they need to keep their traumas to themselves in order to support um, their children or their dependents. Um, I had one experience in the past where um, my client's adjustment of status based on his U visa was denied um, because he had a series of DWIs. Um, and we went on to appeal that denial. Um, and during the appeals process, I worked with him for many hours um, to draft a declaration explaining these DWIs. And through that process, he shared a lot of his backstory with me um, and kind of talked to me about you know, his abusive family dynamic growing up, the fact that, um, you know, his uncle encouraged him to start drinking at age six or seven. Um, and after we were done with that declaration, he told me how good it felt to finally tell somebody his story. And he said he'd never had the chance to really tell anybody the 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 level of details of his life that he had he had shared during that process. Um, and a few months later, we found out that the appeal um, was approved and he was able to get his green card. So that was just a very, um, a very satisf satisfactory moment all around. Oh, what a powerful experience. Um, Cecily, thank you. So I hear you, right? Um, echo chamber. Um, it seems like rescreening has a whole gambit of, of pros and benefits. Um, <clears throat> reflecting back on what you've all said, it sounds like you have a client 
And in this journey, they're experiencing these, these different legal or, or personal changes, maybe not even legal changes, but personal changes. Um, and it seems like a great way to meet the client or, or to better rep or best represent the client is to kind of meet them where they're at at that time. So if your client is always changing, what are the best places then to incorporate this rescreening process? Yeah, so generally throughout the life of representation, you sort of have these natural meeting points with your client. Um, when the children we work with are still in ORR shelters, um, our detained team does a screening with them. Um, and then once they're released, we do another, another level of screening with them, another intake. Um, and then, you know, once we determine what type of relief they're eligible for, we'll sit down with them and sign our retainer agreement. And it's, it's another chance to have a conversation with them, build rapport. Um, and then, of course, as you're working up evidence, as you're working up declarations, um, that's another great opportunity to sort of talk to your clients more and more and learn more about their life. Um, and then you have these smaller meeting points too, court hearings, um, reviewing applications with them, um, them coming in to pick up documents like EADs, and all of those are great, great chances to um, reconnect with your client, um, as well as just any sort of regular checkups you have with them. I think this can be true to incorporate in the detained context when the children are still in ORR custody. Yes, there might be the initial intake, right, where maybe we haven't entered representation yet. But if the client is there for an extended period of time, 30 days, or if there's an upcoming hearing um, or the reunification is being denied and, and we kind of have to take representative action, these are all fine key points where we can conduct these rescreenings. And I know in my experience working on the detained team in the past um, and, and, and hearing from my colleagues in the detained team, we all know that children in detention are least likely to disclose. They're just adjusting. Um, they may not be trusting authority figures yet. They're hyper focused on release and the and the drama of the shelter of that day. Um, so, to whatever extent we can, uh, kind of the idea of anytime we have a client interaction would be a great opportunity to rescreen, even in the detained context. Um, Hannah, I wanted to turn it to you because we, we've identified these different junctures, but how can you, if you could give us an example, how is the client necessarily different? Yeah, thanks, Diana. So, you know, as Cecily mentioned, most of the clients that we, that we see are screened um, or have soon after their initial entry. And then again, uh, soon after their release from the shelter, which oftentimes isn't that long after their initial entry, but they're also doing a lot of adjusting to, um, you know, they've talked to a lot of different people. They're adjusting to new, uh, a new environment and a new culture. And so those, um, they also haven't had a chance at that point to build a lot of rapport from their, with their legal uh, staff or their, their, the social workers that are working with them. And so it could be that in that initial, in those initial screenings, some uh, relief might be missed through no fault of the staff or the people who are working with them. You know, those intakes are kind of a snapshot um, of, of what the child is able to or willing to disclose at that time, but the client's story, um, the client's life isn't paused um, at that or, or fixed in that point in time. And so you know, clients, their sponsors, their family members continue to live their lives. Um, the client that came in for that intake isn't the same client that comes in to sign the, the retainer agreement, isn't the same client who comes in to fill out that, that I-589, and certainly isn't the same client who then, uh, you know, at, at, the, at the point of interview or adjudication of that I-589. Um, just another example, I uh, have a client now who entered the country when he was around three years old. This was about 10 years ago. He was working with an attorney who submitted an I-589 for him because um, there, there wasn't really another option. And it's, it's not um, a frivolous case by any means, but um, it isn't uh, the, the strongest case. And so there was an interview in that case, but the child was still very young. And so the father did did that interview and that was that case was referred to to the court so now years later um, the child is 13 and has had a chance to 
um, go through the, the school system, the public school system. And in working with that child and working with his family, we realized that um, he has various, he's making use of, uh, of various services in the school system. And so um, we were able to get him a psychological assessment and realized that he has some significant um, cognitive uh, delays. And in that case, we're considering asking for a re-interview at USCIS based on the, the issues that this is not the same case, it's not the same facts, it's not the same child that um, existed at the time that this case was interviewed. And this child was not able to um, adequately represent his case at that first interview. And so this is a situation where um, the, the kid now as a 13 year old is totally different. And as a consequence, his case is totally different than it was uh, when that application was filed. Um, talk about a completely different client. You're talking about a three-year-old with no symptoms of a cognitive delay to now a teenage boy who now is showing cognitive delay. Um, when we had prepared with Maida, we wanted her perspective from a social worker. Um, and she kind of shared that in her experience when she worked with clients in ORR care, um, at that point, their main focus was really just in being reunified. And then even once they were reunified, they were hyper-focused on their new environment and adjusting to that new environment, um, building those relationships with caregivers, which sometimes um, it, it's a mom or a dad that they haven't had a relationship with in 10 years or, or, or a pretty long time. And so even uh, it, as the legal case commences then, right, as soon as release occurs, the client is still not really focused on the immigration case. Um, and she also shared that sometimes these new environments can actually ignite and trigger um, PTSD, trauma, or new memories. Uh, and so it could be that the client at the time we're meeting with them, they're not remembering anything and something happens in their personal life here in the United States that triggers a memory that then they can come back to the attorney um, and discuss if that can make them eligible. So for her, uh, there's a lack of focus or there could be irritability, maybe some defiance, um, and maybe not understanding their situation fully yet as they're hyper-focused hyper on their other needs and adjustment. Um, so from her perspective, that, that's how the client is different at each stage. Okay, we've identified the different junctures in which we can, can do some re-screening. Um, I'm curious, in reflecting on your experiences, um, what does rescreening really mean? Each time we're meeting with the client, are we having another one or two hour long like assessment, client consultation, or are they more meet cutes? Um, and, and I was hoping we could start with initial processing. So, Cecily, uh, I know as the legal assistants, you're kind of the first person. In, in the initial processing stage, are you relying on the detention intake or what are you doing at this phase? Yes, thank you so much. So, um, you know, like you said, when children are detained, when the shelter intake is conducted, um, a lot of those children might not feel fully settled yet, fully safe. They've just done a very long and often arduous, sometimes traumatic journey. Um, and then they're in an unknown environment. And I think, you know, the shelter intakes are a wonderful tool to jump off of as I continue to rescreen the clients. Um, but many times um, clients aren't quite ready to disclose everything while they're still in the custody of ORR. Um, so once the children are released, um, it's my job to sort of cold call um, the child's sponsor, um, explain to them who we are as an organization and um, set up a, an appointment for um, the child and sponsor to meet with myself and sometimes with the attorney as well. Um, sometimes it's all my responsibility to do the initial intake. Sometimes the attorney will also be there. Um, I really prefer to have these meetings in person. I think it's so much easier to build rapport that way. Um, and I think the child um, and the sponsor both honestly often feel more comfortable when this is an in-person meeting. Um, so we have sort of templates at our organization to, to guide us as we sit down and do sort of a thorough questionnaire um, with both the child and the sponsor to better assess their form of relief. Um, and that's definitely one of sort of the longer um, intake or screening processes that are that's officially built into 
um, our process. Um, after that, you know, depending on what they're eligible for, we'll have a meeting with the child sponsor and the attorney to sit down and sign the retainer agreement. That's another wonderful opportunity to talk to them a little bit more about what they disclosed in what they disclosed in the intake, um, and um, you know, learn a little bit more more about their their lives. Um, and then, you know, so sometimes cases are transferred internally. Um, we, you know, there is there is turnover at nonprofits. Um, and so when cases get transferred from attorney, different attorney teams, I think it's really important to, for the new team to reach out to the client, um, make contact with them and just, they don't have to do the full intake again, but again, chatting with them to get some sort of sense of what they've been through, what's going on in their life now is, is really crucial. Um, and then, of course, writing their declarations and evidence preparation, that's a wonderful chance to dive deeper into things. Maybe they're ready to disclose further details to you that they didn't feel comfortable um, during the intake process, just because now there is more rapport and more trust. Um, and then I think there are other chances that are, are great opportunities to have sort of check-ins with clients, even if they're a little less official. For example, if they come to our office to for a court hearing, if they're coming to our office to pick up an EAD, um, anything like that. I think I always try to slow down and make sure I make time to ask the client how they're, how they're doing um, and maybe, you know, screen for other forms of relief. For example, when a client, if I'm wondering if a client is U visa eligible, um, I'll often ask them, do they feel safe in the United States? Has anything happened to them um, that has made them feel bad or uncomfortable? Because Often I've noticed if I just ask, have you been the victim of a crime, certain incidents may not register to them um, as having been, um, been, been crimes, but those events may qualify them for a U visa. So just sort of keeping in mind how to ask strategic questions um, when you are just, you know, having a check-in with a client as they come to pick up a document or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I will jump in real quickly here and, and stress that... Uh, all, at all these stages, even in the initial processing, if, um, for example, if most of the in, the intake has been done by my legal assistant, um, I also want to make sure that I go through a very thorough screening um, of the client at that beginning stage, um, just just to make sure that um, we haven't missed something. I think sometimes having multiple contacts or multiple eyes and ears on a client situation can be helpful, especially if we haven't identified any form of relief um, for that client. Um, so like I said, those those might be more um, more in-depth types of, of, of screenings. But also when I inherit a case from someone else, um, I, one of the things to remember, we're not stuck with the prior determination that that we had before. Like if some other the, the other attorney has identified a certain type of relief and we see that there is something else in the file that just kind of piques our interest, it's really important to read that file really thoroughly um, to pick up all the notes um, that might uh, or all the things that might have been missed within that stage. And Cecily, you and I worked on a, on a case like that um, recently. Do you want to want to talk about that one? Yes, I'd be happy to elaborate on that one. So we were transferred a case that um, originally had been determined to be an asylum case. Um, it seemed like the asylum case was quite strong and we were, um, the case was internally transferred to us. Um, but as we continued to sort of work on and try to build up the asylum case, we realized it was going to be a lot more complicated than we thought it would be. Um, our client definitely was suffering from a lot of memory issues as a result of the um, physical and emotional trauma she suffered. Um, and we were sort of worried about her going before um, the immigration judge and before the, um, you know, ICE TA. Um, and so we conducted a very thorough re review of her files. We looked at all prior case notes that had been done. And we found one little small note um, from a previous team that had worked on her case mentioning that um, she had been the victim of domestic violence here in the United States. Um, so that, um, you know, raised some flags for us and we met with her and talked about it. And we found out that um, she had, she had had an abusive partner and that at one point um, the police had been called and she had made a report and cooperated with them on the investigation. Um, and so we decided that, you know, maybe asylum isn't the best option for her. Um, and we ended up closing out her asylum case and are now um, pursuing a U visa with her. 
Um, so I think just it's really important to um, read read files very thoroughly when there's an internal transfer because you know like I said at nonprofits there's can be unfortunately a lot of turnover um, and some with that you sometimes lose um, internal knowledge on a case that one team had. So just being sure to review every notes or if you're transferring a case, make very thorough notes um, about what you've learned from the client. But uh, what a shift in legal strategy. Um, Cecily, you mentioned um, evidence workup being a potential way to rescreen, but Hannah, I'm gonna pull you into this because I'm gonna push back a little bit. Um, if you're going to do rescreening at the evidence workup, can't that be a little bit confusing for the client? Can't that be like exhaustive of your resources, especially if you're trying to move a case forward quickly and get it filed? I don't think it has to be. Um, so I think as new factors come in, you don't have to necessarily do a full stop and do a, a, a rescreen like in the middle of uh, some sort of you're filling out applications or you're working up a declaration. You know, for example, on the U visa uh, case that I that I mentioned before, um, this new information came up as we were talking through her life experience uh, for the purposes of the U visa declaration. And when those trafficking facts came up, you know, I didn't stop the whole uh, the whole process and explain everything about a T visa, and then you know, ask a lot of detailed questions about that experience. Um, you know, we kept working on the declaration, and then um, at at the end of that appointment, you know, I wanted to make sure that she felt um, she knew that I had I had heard this new information and and I appreciated her um, telling us about it. It's not something that we knew about before. And I said, you know, I I would really like to to talk to you more about this um, this experience after we get this this U visa filed. And the reason that I didn't want to go into it um, in depth at that moment was both to um, not not confuse her, um, but also because we did have that that deadline for the U visa, right? That signature on the certification was only valid for, you know, a few more weeks probably at that point. And so, um, you know, we needed to get that filed. And then after the U visa was filed, we had another appointment um, where, you know, I had done a, a little more looking into T visas because I didn't have much experience at that point. And then I had the information to come back and know the questions that I needed to ask her. And um, then we we proceeded to work up the T visa from there. Um, okay, that, that makes sense. So you kind of acknowledge um, and then you pivot back to the case. And then when you have the space, you come back and revisit it. Something that you've all kind of touched on a little bit is the incorporation of family or sponsors into this rescreening process. Um, does this mean that you're constantly rescreening family members or sponsors? What exactly does that look like? Well, I think that this kind of, this actually goes back to the periodic check-ins as well, um, or just depends on when you're meeting with your client or what types of meeting you're having with a, with a client. I I actually do work rescreening into most of my client contacts. Um but it looks differently depending on who I'm meeting with and what I'm meeting to do, um, what, what I'm what I'm doing during that meeting with them. For example, if I'm meeting with a client themselves um, and we're talking about a declaration, for example, I would always reserve some time during that conversation to have a very short, brief um, conversation with the client just to see how are you doing? What's your experience now? What's going on in your life right now? And ask very open-ended questions just to uh, to gauge what's going on in their life or what, what is also going on in their family's life. Um, listening carefully at the whole time for clues uh, to whether the child or the family members have experienced some kind of harm, some kind of exploitative um, situation, or maybe had some kind of change in relationship that might... Uh, open them up to other types of relief. Now, these aren't really long conversations. I'm not talking about like 30 minutes on top of another hour call. I'm just talking about a 10 minute conversation. And if you're doing that consistently, um, then, you know, things do, it, it helps to build rapport, first of all. And second, it helps for them to feel comfortable to bring up those very traumatic things that they're experiencing now, because trauma happens when they're here in the United States as well, unfortunately, um, right? So it, it helps them to bring that up or maybe memories from the past where they had forgotten or, or weren't comfortable enough to share. I also do that when I'm speaking with a sponsor. For example, I often have to 
um, talk with a sponsor about evidence gathering. Um, and when, or talk with a sponsor to get some kind of evidence or, or follow up with evidence. And I always create a space within that conversation as well to have just a update on their life. How are things going? Have you, are you in the same house situation as before? Um, do you have access to food? What, what, what types of things are going on in your life so that we can be looking for those, those moments. If you build those conversations or you build those moments into the conversations you're already having, it really helps to build a, the sustainability of your rescreening pra practice. Otherwise, it's almost impossible, right? Because you can't schedule enough calls to necessarily rescreen um, a client all the time. But because you're already planning on meeting with the client, you're already planning on speaking with their sponsor or their case, then you're opening that door to, to a short discuss, a discussion about the ups and downs of their lives. And if they do share something that's important, then you can schedule a follow-up appointment um, to assess eligibility for another type of relief. I, I have a really good example of that. Deanna and I, you, you and I both worked on this case uh, of two kids that had been abused in their home country. And because of their age and trauma, we were just having so much trouble working up their asylum family PSG case. Um, the, the children were giving some conflicting accounts of abuse by their aunt, possibly by the, the grandparent in the home country, country, and it was really hard to get them to open up to what had happened, um, likely because of their ages. One of the children was only about five when we were doing these asylum interviews, and in one, or, one, one way or another, we hit a, a wall with that case. Uh, so when we talked to the sponsor, which was their mother, we conducted a, a short kind of rescreening of her, and we learned that the children were eligible for uh, to be U derivatives on a U visa because of domestic violence that she had experienced here in the United States. Um, and one of the benefits of being able to provide that to those particular children is that as we were working up the asylum, um, the, the asylum case. Uh, we really felt like we were re-traumatizing re re the children as we were talking about that. So it was it was good that we were able to then focus on the U visa case so as not to re-victimize or re-traumatize the children. Yeah, I, I remember that case. We couldn't get an overarching uh, legal narrative, right? Couldn't figure out exactly who is the persecutor um, and, and the different kinds of persecution they experienced or the connection, the nexus component. So I think had it not been for connecting with the mother, I'm not sure how we would have proceeded on the asylum. Um, that's a that's a great example, um, Alyssa. Um, okay, I guess to fuel our toolbox, what exactly are you rescreening for? What's going on in the back of your minds um, when you're kind of talking to these clients, these sponsors, and these family members? So you kind of have to have um, everything you can fit in the back of your mind, right? As you're having these conversations, you know, and working with unaccompanied children, we often kind of live in the world of SIJS and asylum and the occasional U and T, maybe a VAWA in there. But you really have to be familiar with more than that. Um, you know, Cecily and Alyssa mentioned short rescreens during client communications or check-in combos. Um, you know, in a in a previous when I was working for for a different organization, I had I was working with a, a Brazilian family with their asylum claim, and that claim had been pending. Uh, it was an affirmative claim; they had come on visas, so we filed with USCIS, and it was pending for about a year and a half. We had already done a, a good bit of of workup, and we're just sort of waiting. But you know, I I had a a call with them just to kind of check in, um, give them an update, which was there are no updates. Um, and in that conversation, which is what with the, the mother of the family, you know, I was asking about each one of her family members. And I found out that her, her son, her, who was an adult at that point, um, was dating a, a U.S. citizen and, um, you know, was getting pretty serious. They'd been dating for about a year or so. And she had told him, well, you know, hold your horses, like, make sure we don't get married until we figure out this asylum thing. I said, Oh, actually, um, let's talk more about that. Because maybe, 
if if it's actually that's what he wants to do is marry this this woman, then um, that might not be that bad of an idea. And it opened up the possibility for this family who had come on visas. Um, you know, if this if her son marries a U.S. citizen and eventually becomes a U.S. citizen himself, you know, their immediate relatives, um, his parents, and so um, you know they can adjust here in the United States, and he can even petition for. Um, his younger siblings, so that's obviously a longer process. You know, I haven't worked in family petitions since before law school, but I know the basic facts, right? Like I know that they're a thing that that exists, and they can have a lot of advantages over um, over asylum for various reasons. And you know, I I've never done work on a cancellation case, cancellation of removal, but I know sort of the very basic facts, so that when I'm talking to somebody, if a relevant detail um, comes up, then I I know enough to go back, do my own research, and then have more conversations um, with those clients. So, you know, you don't have to have to know all of the details of all of the type of cases, but it's good to know the very basics of as many types of cases um, that you as you can, and then, you know, where, know where to look uh, to, to do more research when different things come up that sort of uh, throw up some some flags or pique your your interest yeah i, I want to point out in the chat that there's conversation about incorporating tps into the screening absolutely this is not necessarily meant to be an exhaustive list just a screenshot and we do have clients some of which have pending asylum applications but we've also applied tp um uh, we've applied on their behalf for tps um go ahead Alyssa. i didn't mean to interrupt you Yes, I was also going to point out um, this this visual is actually something I have hanging in my office. Um, and when I rescreen clients, I'm a very visual person. So I have this visual and then I also have all the other forms of relief that I want to keep in the back of my mind that are also kind of like attached around that visual. <laughs> so, you know, a family petition, cancellation of removal, TPS, I have them in my site while I'm actually talking with clients. And that way I can glance up and see, oh, is there anything else that I, you know, what are the, what, what are things that I'm really looking for, you know, within each of those types of um, relief? It just helps me. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that I think it's really important to, to just point out to be really successful at the rescreening, you just have to be creative, <laughs> you know, as an attorney. You really, um, not all cases are going to look the same and not all clients are going to have the same lived experience, right? So we want to look at the lived experience of each client and at our job is to listen deeply to that lived experience and then see what relief is based on that experience, right? Um, I encourage people to try and move away from only the idea of looking for certain red flags, um, but but really to have a more holistic approach to questioning clients about their lived experience. Um, red flags are good, and, you know, to to really kind of start with. But you need to think we need to think very deeply um, about um, about other ways that th these reliefs might manifest. I'll give just a quick example. Um, here in Texas, we have common law marriage, um, and I had a client that that was. Uh, able to apply for um, a, as a T derivative because he was in a common law marriage with um, someone that was already T approved. And so, I mean, you just really can, kind of thinking out of the box is really important sometimes. Um, otherwise you miss relief. And I know for some of the family separation, right? There's the parole in place opportunity that became open. Um, so there's, there's lots of creative ways um, I, to the panel, I just want to remind us that we have about five minutes. Um, so I want to kind of fast forward a little bit to um, what can make it successful. And Alyssa, you touched on um, rapport building in, when you were kind of discussing the rescreening process. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, I, I think that really we always need to go back to those principles of active listening um, when we're when we're speaking with our clients we need to hear and understand our clients experiences you know what if it's culturally appropriate maintaining eye contact um, sometimes helps um asking open-ended questions to encourage deeper sharing 
uh, noticing nonverbal cues. So it might might be easier sometimes in an in-person um, meeting and versus a virtual to notice some of those cues. Uh, but also allowing moments of silence in conversation. Um, it's just in order to encourage more timid individuals to share uh, or more difficult sharing. Paraphrasing and repeating back what we've heard um, being said. And the real point here is basically you're listening to understand instead of just listening to respond or give advice. Yeah, I also just want to, you know, focus on the important of this importance of the small stuff. Um, if you have a scheduled meeting beyond time, that's a really important sign of respect. It's a sign you value um, their case. Um, and I also just want to say, you know, take time with your interviewing and be patient. Um, that's one thing I love about working for a nonprofit is that there's a little bit less of a sense of rush. You're encouraged to give a client time to express themselves and time to talk. I have had times where sometimes I feel like a client is, is spending a long time talking to me. Um, and, you know, you might think, okay, this isn't quite relevant, but if you're patient, you give them time to, to tell their story, make them feel safe. They might mention something that's sort of a little hint at another form of relief they might be available for. So just give them the space they need to, to share and, and, you know, be sure to be listening actively to whatever they tell you. I like to also make sure that I'm clear about what the process is and the goals are, whether that's at the beginning of a case or at the beginning of any individual appointment so that the client knows what to expect. Um, and, you know, when we meet those goals, we can revisit, okay, this is what we talked about the process is, and this is what, um, what our goal was. We've met that goal. Now the next step is, you know, whatever, whatever the next step is. Um, I also like to remind the clients that um, they are, they're the boss, right? Um, it's their case. It's their, uh, we can do what they want to do, right? In the meetings, if they need to take breaks, if they need to stop at some point, then, then we can do that. You know, whenever there's a, a juncture in a case where we need to make a decision about what to do, even if I think I know what would be best for the case strategically, you know, I want to make sure to present it to the client and give them all the information that they need to be able to make a decision. And then one thing that I found really useful in talking to young kids or in talking to really anybody, if I'm, if I'm wanting to, to talk to them about traumatic events, is to bring um, fidget toys or something to, to interviews. You know, I recently had an appointment with um, a teenager. There we go. Um, and I brought um, a fidget toy. We've got lots of them in my house. I've got toddlers. And so I brought a poppet and I put it on the table and I said, you know, sometimes when I'm talking, I like to do something with my hands. It's there if you want it. And she picked it up right away and we had a really good meeting. So I think that those kinds of things, um, those little extra things can be really helpful um, in building rapport and, and getting the information. Um, yeah. Um, I want to take this last minute to kind of highlight some of Maida's perspectives and experiences. And, and for her in building rapport, it was really critical to explain her role as the social worker, her ethical duties in, in maintaining confidentiality um, and mandatory reporting requirements. And then going in and just talking about silly things, even asking clients what their favorite dinosaur is. Um, she usually tries to bring a game or creative activity. Um, and that's definitely one way that she's been able to incorporate that. Um, in her role, um, uh, she's the senior social services coordinator for client. So one of that component was going into detention and providing emotional support to minors in those facilities. And she really found it helpful in those one-on-one -on -one meetings to have expressive art activities. And that was key in providing um, that or creating that rapport. Um, we are at time team. Um, so really, um, I just want to highlight for everyone a couple of um, takeaways um, while we conclude this session. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated um, your participation. Um, I will note um, there was a, a question about the 30-year backlog on the asylum. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to wait 30 years for your interview. That really just means that um, 
based on the number of pending cases and the number of officers available to do an asylum interview a day, that can just mean that it's going to take the USCIS asylum office nationally 30 years to get through all those current claims or applications rather. So that doesn't mean you're going to wait 30 years for your interview. You could be interviewed at any time. Um, but that's kind of what that means. And the SIJS revocations, um, that was something that we were seeing during the Trump administration. Thank you again.